so doing that and all right well welcome you guys welcome to our attendees or anyone watching this later we're super excited to talk about nonprofits and how to start one or at least some of the basic steps of that we uh, at the women's business center get lots of questions about starting and running and what it takes to have a nonprofit agency. So we have um, invited three really special guests today to this webinar to talk about exactly that. They all have unique experiences with nonprofits. Um, and so I wanted to let them introduce themselves in a second. My name is Jesse Yankee. I'm the director at the Missouri Women's Business Center. We um, are a nonprofit program of Central Missouri Community Action, and we help women and men too. Uh, to start and grow businesses. So we have a lot of awesome clients who maybe even are already running a business, but now they're thinking about a nonprofit arm. So I will now uh, introduce my, or let our people that have joined us today introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Terry? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience in the nonprofit world? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Terry Walden and um, I, started a nonprofit in 2013 and was pretty naive about starting one. Uh, but I had a sense of urgency, which is where everybody who wants to start a, a, a nonprofit uh, begins with. Uh, an urgency, a personal uh, need, a uh, public need, whatever. And, um, and so uh, I, um, anyway, that's, that's my experience with it and I love to talk about nonprofits and what it takes to uh, keep it going. My non the nonprofit is still going today and um, uh, seven years, seven, eight years later. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm so happy to be here today. I'm from Columbia and have lived here for about 20 years and um, originally from Southern Missouri. Awesome, thank you, Terry. Uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn, why don't you give us your introduction? Thank you, Jesse. And I let me first say that I'm honored to be on the panel with Crystal and Terry this morning. Uh, they're two local rock stars in, in this sector. So thank you for me. Thank you for inviting me to join them. So my name is Carolyn Sullivan, and I run a business called New Chapter Coaching. And we started in 2008 to try to address a need for more capacity building for nonprofits. I had been an executive director of a nonprofit and a little known fact, years ago, I was a part of a merry band of people who started a nonprofit. Um, but I hope my ignorance about all those matters don't get reflected here today. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I've been doing that for almost 13 years. It's my uh, life's work, it's my passion. So our mission is to build a better world by increasing the effectiveness of nonprofit leaders and the impact of the organizations they serve. And so we, we, we don't do a lot of startup work, but I know uh, a bit about that part of the process. We usually catch the organizations once they've stood themselves up and then they come to us saying, help, yeah. uh, usually. Uh, yes, it sure did. <laughs> <laughs> thank and, you so much. And we're happy to help. Yay, thank you, Carolyn. Um, that is awesome. And Crystal, can you introduce yourself and your um, experience running a nonprofit? Um, hello, hello. First off, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to join both, both Carrie and Carolyn. Um, on this panel, um, my name is Crystal. I am the co-founder with Dr. Melita Walker of the Bold Academy. Um, and we have been uh, a nonprofit here in Columbia for the last five years. So this is year five for us. Um, and the nonprofit part really just started out of a passion and a need. Um, and um, Bold serves girls ages 12 to 17 um, in Columbia Black and Brown, helping pipeline them into post-secondary education. For me, um, I, want, I run a for-profit business, um, which kind of led to the nonprofit part. Um, so my experience has been not knowing anything about a nonprofit, meeting someone who um, worked with Carolyn, who helped me see the ropes um, after about a year, a year and a half, two years in. Um, and so I've kind of done um, a little bit of changes, um, but I think we started on solid ground and been enabled to uh, keep it going. So five years strong. 
That is awesome. Congrats. And we love the Bold Academy. The Women's Business Center definitely supports the Bold Academy whenever we can. Amazing program. So Thank that's you. exciting. Thank you guys so much. Um, for anybody watching this, please utilize the chat or the Q&A sections uh, if you have any questions for our panelists as we go through um, some of our discussion today. We'll make sure to answer those at the end. So we wanted to kind of start with the basics. Um, so people come into the Women's Business Center a lot and they're considering starting a nonprofit. Um, and they say, what, what are the things I need to know versus starting a for-profit? So what are some things that uh, potential entrepreneurs need to know uh, on their journey to deciding whether they should be for-profit or non-profit? And let's start with uh, Carolyn. Well, Terry hit one of them. You know, she said she was naive and uh, I'd love to hear what she was naive about, but um, you know, starting a nonprofit is not any easier than starting a for-profit. They are both businesses and having done both, I would argue that starting a nonprofit, I, I say this often to, to my clients that I've done a lot in my life um, and starting the non you know, running a nonprofit, um, never mind starting, was the hardest thing that I ever did. And, um, and I just, you know, finished a year in a global pandemic with my business. So, uh, and that wasn't even uh, harder than running a non small nonprofit. So it's not for the faint of heart. You need grit, you need patience, you need hustle. Um, and both Crystal and Terry in their opening remarks talked about the combination of passion. So you need that passion. If you don't have passion for the purpose, don't even think about stepping off the curve. And then you need need. There needs to be an, an unmet need in the community that you're addressing. And so doing that research, if you're interested in, you know, ending childhood poverty, who else is working on that issue? Oh, CMCA, Central Missouri Community Action is. Well, let me get with them and find out where the food bank is. Let's get with them. Let's find out do they have everything covered or is there a niche that I can, an unmet need that I can help uh, fill? But don't, you know, we don't need nonprofits to be started just to have nonprofits, vanity projects. There's, there's um, lots of collaboration that can happen if people think, it, think about it, um, but it's not ego work, you know? So uh, that's something. What is the problem you're trying to solve? by starting a nonprofit is a good question to ask yourselves. Um, I'll stop there and, and let my colleagues jump in. Yeah, I think you were um, right on the money that a lot of what we see is uh, people think it's somehow easier, <laughs> which I think I, you absolutely have hit on the head that it's not. So Crystal, um, how about your perspective? Um, my perspective, I always approach everything like I'm such a systematic person. Um, so I always, I always approach everything from the systems perspective and kind of how I approach business. So when you start a nonprofit, really thinking about who your target audience is um, from the financial stake point of it um, and thinking about, um, I always say nonprofits have to think about not just who their target is as far as who they're serving, but who their target audience is as far as how they plan to function and serve the communities. So your donors, um, your sponsors, your supporters, your general supporters. So thinking about it from that point of view as well. Um, the other part I think about is that it's not a money generating thing. So realizing that a nonprofit is, um, you're not going to make any money. You're not doing this for anything other than the support of what you're trying to bring attention to and who you're trying to serve. Um, so I think that's one of the big things when you decide if you're doing a for-profit or, or a nonprofit. And then um, when starting understanding the structures of nonprofits, I think sometimes when we start nonprofits, we're like, um, when you think about your board members, like thinking about what the board members, each one kind of brings to the table and understanding how boards work and understanding how you as, as founders or starters are part of that board, I think is huge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, so those were, those are the, some of the biggest things for me that I would think about. Um, and like Carolyn said, not um, doubling the efforts um, that are already out there, but seeing how you can partner or how you can find a niche when something's not being met. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Terry, anything else to add to what they've already said? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when you start a nonprofit, sometimes there is an idea out there that, that grants and free money are really easy to receive. And it's definitely not the case. Um, and you have to have quite a bit of infrastructure uh, to even put your hand out. And so you really need to start with, with funds. Um, so the funds aren't going to come to you. You need to start just like a for-profit business where you have uh, some stability in your, on, on your in your finances because you will probably not be paid for at least a couple of years. And then I argue that you have to build in a salary in order for the nonprofit to become a sustainable one in case you leave and you need to hire somebody else uh, because you know it's unlikely that somebody's going to just step in without that salary. And there's nothing wrong with a, a nonprofit leader getting a salary. That's what you want to try to, to go for so that it can be sustainable in the future. Um, and so that, that money that is supposed to come in uh, really takes a lot of investment. So you need to have a good fundraising source before you hit the ground running. And, you know, we did a, 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 a Indigo campaign, which is um, uh, crowdfunding. And so we had about $27,000 just to start out with. And so it's really important to think about building, you know, that revenue to do the, this service work and not expecting it to get to come back to you in the same way that a for-profit would. Um, but that's one of the things that I think is, is out there that people really believe that a nonprofit can get free money almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, if you, but you have to, you know, develop that system out over a span of, I'd say three to five years in order to be able to get substantial grants. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, one of the things that pops in my head is that you really have to have a skill for writing um, because you're gonna be doing a lot of writing in that role. So that would be another, like something I would tell my clients of, um, you're gonna need to have a strong writer on your board or on your staff or with yourself to, to do the grant writing necessary to get that funding. So thank you guys for that perspective. I think you all hit it absolutely on the head of some of the main things. Can so, I just add one more thing? Yeah, one please. More thing about like people have to, uh, founders need to realize that uh, until they develop their staff, they are not just the executive director, they are the, the, the chief fundraiser, mm -hmm. right? And that takes a skill that most executive directors do not care for. Right. Mm -hmm. I had I knew one call, former colleague who referred said I'd rather chew glass than fundraise. OK, and a lot <laughs> of a lot of executives feel that way. But when you're starting a nonprofit, you've got to be able to ask for money. And so mm -hmm. if you don't have that skill set, you almost don't have a, any business starting a nonprofit. For sure. You, Absolutely. So along those same lines, so um, when you've got some people that say, okay, great, I, I don't care, I'm gonna be a great executive director, I'm gonna help fundraise, I know I'm gonna do all that stuff, and they move down the path of, of uh, legalizing their nonprofit, what are the common mistakes that you see in a brand new nonprofit or someone that's growing a nonprofit? What are some common mistakes that they should try to avoid? Um, let's go with Terry first on that one. Um, okay, so uh, I think, you know, I hit on one that that um, money is easy to get. Um, it's not. I mean, you have to pound the pavement. And I think that your fundraising, even if you're uncomfortable with it or don't have experience, um, if you have a sense of urgency about it, you will put yourself in those uncomfortable uh, positions. And so, um, so maybe some mistakes are that people are, are holding back and not re realizing that um, let your sense of passion or urgency drive you and go out and meet as many people as you can. You can't hole up and be um, shy. <laughs> You've got to get out there and, um, and beat the pavement. Um, I also think that uh, people uh, trust too much that volunteers will just show up and everything will go smoothly. And volunteers are wonderful. And we do know some great organizations who um, have some super volunteer, but they, 
volunteers, but they also have somebody who's coordinating those, managing those. They have some type of accountability or reward system. I mean, it's very complex to keep volunteers um, showing up and being consistent. Um, the University of Missouri is a great place for volunteers through service learning students, um, but yet they're getting something from it from the classes. So um, I think often like I went in there thinking, oh, they are going to volunteer. They are going to be just as determined as I am about this mission. And, um, but life will interfere with somebody who's not as committed as you are. So I wouldn't put uh, too much stock in, in volunteers because you're gonna have some trouble. You're gonna have, you're gonna be let down a bit. Thank you. Uh, Crystal, what, what are some of the things you would say are common mistakes that can be made when starting a nonprofit? Um, so I would um, kind of piggyback back off of what Terry said when she talked about like fundraising and money and thinking about it's just like in business, like understanding money management and that there has to be a very solid structure in the nonprofit um, some accounting, accounting management training, when you finish at the end, understanding um, like your taxes, when you have to file those at the end of the year. Um, having really like, I, I look at nonprofits, they truly are businesses. So having a business plan, just the same way that you would when you're starting and tackling a startup. Um, the other part would be making sure that you have a dedicated board. Like I get it that we are all um, starting it with a passion and that we're we can be all the things, um, but really you need to make sure that you have a, a board who are willing to do all the things with you, especially when you're starting. Um, so again, picking those board members that truly um, have the same passion that you have, because like Terry said, you, you're bored and you may be the only volunteers that you have some time to get the mission across. Um, and then just making sure that you have the time that you need to invest in it. And um, I recently had someone reach out to me about a nonprofit and someone was gifting in their nonprofit. And they're like, oh, you can take this over and you can change the name. So just really understanding the legal aspects of having a 501c3 and what that looks like from the way that you have it um, it's set up um, and understanding the structures um, and that it just doesn't pop up um, because people who are donating to you at the end of the at the end of the day are going to want some sort of receipt for that. Um, so again, going back to that whole financial structure and systems, making making sure they're set up um, effectively. Yeah, and awesome. That's amazing advice. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into that later in this session about legalities and how to recruit a good board. So thank you, Carolyn. Anything to add about common mistakes? You see, you work with nonprofits all day, every day. I'd love to hear some of the mistakes that they made at the startup phase that has impacted them later um, in their journey. Thinking they can do it all by themselves is one, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is hard, 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 and I could go on with the hards, work. <laughs> and it is, it, I, I said before, it's not for the faint of heart. And um, they think they can do it all themselves. And it doesn't matter how weak or strong the board is. And we're going to talk about the board later. And Crystal just mentioned the board, but um, not, this relates to board recruitment, but I've seen the mistake of filling the board with your friends. Mm -hmm. filling the board with any worn bodies. Oh, Jane, Jane helped sweep the floor after the last event. Let's get Jane on the board. She must care about our organization. <laughs> no, right? Setting your standards, if, especially at the beginning when you're desperate for any warm body, right? Mm -hmm. But don't settle for any warm body. You want someone who's as passionate about the mission or close as you are. Those will, otherwise you're going to have engagement problems. I work with organizations that have board engagement problems all, and, and you wonder why? Well, they just, you know, they're doing it because it looks good on their resume or for whatever other reason. So gotcha. good recruitment. Um, the other mistake I see is thinking that just doing the work is enough, is enough to achieve success. And Crystal alluded to this. You know, when I was in ED many moons ago, a, a senior ED said to me, Carolyn, you have two jobs as an executive director. I'm like two? I thought it was two million and two. What are the two? Boil it down for me. And she said, do good work. And most of the nonprofits that we work with 
are doing good work, right? Do good work and get the word out about the good work you're doing. And that starts at the very beginning, right? And so even while you're doing IRS filings and this, that, and the other thing, right? You've got to be evangelizing your, your passion for the mission, et cetera, um, and getting the good work, uh, getting the good word out about what you're intending to do or actually doing. Um, and then the third is piggytailing off of Crystal's idea about systems and processes. And I would say it's about um, thinking you don't have to evaluate your board, your executive director. Mm. Oh, Crystal, oh, Terry, they're fantastic. They've got it all together. They don't need any feedback from us. And pretty much every single executive director I've ever had a one-on-one -on -one with has yearned for more meaningful, actionable feedback from their board. And so setting up a system where they're getting it from the beginning so that you're in partnership for growing this board, I think is important. And it's a mistake not to do that. Oh, that's a really great one. Thank you so much for that. I think um, a, a lot of uh, people that come to us about starting a nonprofit have no idea that they have to have a board. I, it is a requirement. Uh, so we talk a lot about that and that you're at their mercy. And so in some aspects, it's really their nonprofit and they can kind of boot you out if you aren't performing the way you should be. Um, so that's always a, a something we talk about right away. And then I loved your point about telling the story about what you're doing. The Women's Business Center is a nonprofit. We've been around for five years. We do incredible work and we do a terrible job at telling our story. So I'm also working on that. It's in its hard because you have to do it all at once, right? So yeah. thank you guys so much for that. Um, okay, so moving on a little bit. So what is the process, you guys have all been through this individually, um, of legally registering and becoming a nonprofit and some of the costs associated with that? Um, Carolyn, why don't you start this time? I'm in the I'm in the worst position to start it. I think the okay. other two are closer well, sure, to- Oh, sure, then let's start with Crystal. I, I, I'm honest about what I know and what I don't know. They're, they're, they've just been through it in the last- 15 years. Yep, let's do it. Crystal, why don't you get start? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I was going to sneeze and I didn't want to sneeze during Carolyn's yeah. thing. So I muted myself and forgot. Um, if we're talking about the registration um, and um, the legality of it. So the first thing is um, a name and, and registering your name. Um, with the, um, I believe it's the secretary of state. I still believe it's the same when you do your business as when you do your business, okay. um, or, um, I'll tell you how we did it. So for me, I, when we came about, I knew that I wanted it to be a nonprofit. I had women that have been sitting in my chair and I had literally for a year and a half been picking who I wanted, um, to work with and with my nonprofit co-founder, uh, Dr. Walker, she was one of my clients. And I was like, you're really good in education um, and writing. So I think you would, this is my idea. I would love for you to support me in it. And we talked through what we wanted that to look like before we went into creating um, the articles of incorporation and your bylaws. So those are things that you want to have in place um, before you ever really step into um, going to figure out um, for me, I, we use, um, at the time my financial planner turned us on to a lawyer who, um, we came with him with the bylaws. Um, we knew what we kind of wanted to do for the meetings. Um, and then he kind of did the rest of the work for us as a donation. And we kind of paid the fees. Um, I think we paid about $250 to get started, but on average, I've kind of did a little bit of research. It's about seven fifty for the state of Missouri to, um, get all the bylaws together, the articles of operation, get your EIN number. Um, I would say familiarize yourself with your state's laws. So Missouri laws, if, I don't know who's, if we have people watching in other places. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say about 750 is what you're looking at if you're doing it on your own. If you're like me, um, I would say find someone who, a lawyer locally that has a passion for your cause um, and see if you can find someone to help you on the back end of that with filing um, with the state of Missouri to get you your official 5013C status. Um, so that's what I would say. I don't know if anyone else has anything extra yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, that, that was very thorough. Terry or Carolyn, anything else uh, legal, legality wise or startup costs that you 
um, would add yeah. to that? Yeah, you, you definitely need to file for your IRS tax exemption status. And that is something that took much longer. Uh, once we submitted our very comprehensive application and it is complex, so it probably is good to have an attorney or if you, know, if you understand that and like to do your research, then I think you could do it on your own, but just have somebody else check it. But that IRS uh, tax exemption status took about five months for us to get it. They were backlogged with uh, a lot of, of, I guess, other <laughs> things to do at the IRS, uh, go figure. And, um, and so I would, I would you know, count on that little bit of lead time before you can actually open your doors. And that's a little bit stressful because uh, you may be wanting to get uh, donations and things like that to help get your business started. So um, you may not have that for a while. So plan ahead. There's also a state tax exemption that you need to apply for um, through, through, through their, um, uh, what is it, Department of Revenue. Okay. And um, so yeah, those are two important things that can hold you up a bit. Mm -hmm. I think I'll take all of those tips and make a cheat sheet that we can just hand people when they ask us <laughs> about this with hot links to those websites. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. So we kind of touched on this a little bit um, earlier, but how do nonprofits make income to support operations? Um, and, you know, how difficult is it to get grants, uh, grant funding as a new organization? Um, uh, Carolyn, do you want to start with that one? Um, it's, it's not easy. When I was in ED, and that was in the early um, aughts, right, 2002 to 2005, mm -hmm. for three and a half years, it, I survived on general operating support grants. Mm -hmm. um, I know Terry and Crystal are probably jealous of that fact. Now they've pretty much gone the way, I mean, there's some out there, but they've pretty much gone the way of the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And what the implication of that is that for the most part, the grants you're getting, and I'll also tell you, Jesse Yankee, mm -hmm. the grants you're getting come with restrictions, mm -hmm. right? So you can, you, I'll give you $50,000, but you have to spend it this way and you have to report back on how you spent it. Whereas before it was, you might have to report back, but nobody was going to really question, the, the level of scrutiny was totally different. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is it's more difficult, make no mistake, it's more difficult for a funder to um, award in a grant, award a grant to a new nonprofit. Let's fl flip the script for a moment. Let's imagine we're all sitting around and we're the investment committee for whomever, mm -hmm. and we're looking at applications and one is a new nonprofit that we know nothing about, they haven't delivered anything, and the other is Bold Academy or, or Encircle, and they've got a, a record of outcomes. Who are we gonna invest in? Who are we gonna give that grant to? And that's what new nonprofits face. So that's, those are serious headwinds that they face right off the bat um, in terms of funding. Um, yeah, I feel um, that way as well, that you really need to have some outcomes uh, to be able to truly apl uh, apply for grants. And I felt that one about general operating support in my soul. <laughs> we struggle with that. Even at the Women's Business Center, it's really hard to find grants to support salaries. Um, even though the salaries are the ones that do the work, um, it is tough. Most, most grants want to buy you stuff, which is great, <laughs> but you really need the people to operate the stuff. So um, I think that's a great uh, point. Uh, Terry, anything to add there? Oh, I've got so much to add to this. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, um, Carolyn is, is, is right. It's just, you have to prove yourself, which is that relationship building piece of starting a nonprofit is so crucial. Like, you know, like you have to have credibility and people have to take a chance on you. So, you know, our crystal, like you have identified those people who do have clout, who is part of the Bold Academy to be on your board. If you can use their credibility too, um, to help get some of those local funds that you need, uh, that's going to help, but you've got to be out there as well. There are some organizations that are a little bit more startup friendly 
And so I, you know, I like to just provide a, a small list to a few of the people who I know who are starting nonprofits. And, um, and they, you know, every dollar matters to a startup. Every single dollar matters. Um, another way that, that people could get money is looking at other organizations who might pay for the services that you are providing. You know, for instance, uh, Boone County Family Resource Group was one of the organizations who paid uh, for our students to take classes at Encircle Technologies because that was part of, of their service provision. So we were able to um, pay our teachers, pay our rent, um, you know, pay our, some of our utilities or whatever at the beginning because we identified that organization, you know, made some inroads and they were able to, to pay us. And so then we become more well-known as a service provider and build that clout. Um, you know, accreditation, uh, if, you know, not all nonprofits are the same. Some are advocacy groups and some are direct service groups. If you're an advocacy group, you don't maybe have all the overhead of a direct service group and um, what they need. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's a unique financial picture for each type of nonprofit. Um, but if you are a direct service group, getting accreditation is one thing that you have to be on track to get because only until you get there and it's a long, arduous, you know, mountain trek, can you get access to like state funds? And that was about a $20,000 investment about five years. And when we finally merged with another larger nonprofit um, who liked what we were doing and took us on because we'd already, you know, kind of figured it, figured it out what the service would be. And um, we finally got there to that pot of money with all strings attached. <laughs> But um, so it does, that accreditation is something that you should look for. And Crystal, your point about financial management systems is so important right from the get-go because otherwise you, you, know, you need that audit, you need um, you know, those, those hallmarks of uh, good, good accounting in order for people to even consider you. And that was a stumbling block for us as we kind of, we're trying to figure out, you know, different service providers uh, who would help us do that piece. So, thank you. Um, you guys are just like I'm. I know uh, several of the coaches at the WBC are watching this, and I know we're all just like, oh, this is such. We actually have content to give to our clients that ask for these type of things now. So, thank you so much, Crystal. Anything else to add about uh, what we've talked about so far? Um, I don't think so. I but one of the things I would say is um, sometimes making it fun. So when you're thinking about grant writing or fundraising and I'm um, thinking about fun, right, fun way you can bring your community in to see the work that you do and raise money. Um, I know that we have been fortunate enough to throw um, like a Galentine's Day event and it's an opportunity for women coming together to support the young ladies in our community and it's a fun fundraiser. So thinking about fun ways as well. Um, but I think both Carolyn and Terry really covered it with the grant writing and the outcomes. I think outcomes are the huge part of when you go apply for grants is that you just better be ready to show the outcomes because they're coming for them. Yeah, so. absolutely. Can I add two things on it? Absolutely. Well, it, one goes back to what Terry said earlier about relationship building. So even if I know I'm, I'm a brand new nonprofit and there's no way the Missouri Foundation for Health is going to give me a grant anytime soon, beginning to call or Boone Electric or whomever, beginning to cultivate that relationship early, like putting yourself on their radar and, and keeping in touch and stewarding that relationship is, is as important as a regular GNQ public donor who you would have in the community. Um, and then there was a second point. Oh, um, uh, the Galentine's uh, event, whose labor uh, makes that successful? Um, so it's really Hoot Design Co. Kristen Graham Brown and Hoot Design Co. really um, help. They, I mean, they make it happen between them and HD events. Um, they make that come together every year. And I think it really stemmed from um, 
I think it started with Kristen doing something for the rainbow house. And then the, I, it was such a great idea. And then she was like, this is something I want to do every year. And I would love to do it for bold. Um, and she sits on our board. And so it's been, um, such a great success. So, so that, that goes to my point, right? Events, people gravitate towards events, especially new nonprofits, but all, all every nonprofit seems to gravitate to an event. But when you really do the analysis, some events are not lucrative yeah. right? because you've spent so many staff hours running them, preparing for them, running them, that at the end of the day, the math doesn't work for you. And so I would just caution, especially new nonprofits, that that's the best strategy for them. Yeah. Unless you've got a crystal situation where it's a board member and her team running the whole thing and there's no, no labor costs to you. Um, yeah. that's, that's different. Yeah, I've been, comes, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I've been in that boat of, of putting too much time in a fundraising. But on the other hand, I've been doing fun, a fundraising event, which was like our video game tournament. Um, that really got us a lot of press and sponsorships yeah. from businesses. And right. So there, was, there was that relationship piece in it that really paid out, out for it, although it did take a lot of time. But another event that I did, it was <laughs> so much time and not enough return. So analyzing those becomes important. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, sometimes you're going to lose money, you know that, but it's worth it for the marketing reasons. Yeah. So knowing why you're doing it and what the return is. Yeah. And putting to, putting together unique things, like what you just said about a video game tournament, like we can only have so many golf tournaments and 5Ks um, that be, thinking outside the box with your fundraiser events and, and then making sure that they're financially going to work for you is, is definitely an avenue that we have seen as well as a nonprofit. So um, thank you guys so much. So uh, here's an interesting question. We get a lot of uh, for-profit businesses that come in and they say, I want to start a nonprofit arm of my business. Um, you know, how does that work in your experience or, or, or you know, vice versa? Can a nonprofit have a profitable side? Um, any feedback on, on how to run those two concurrently or do they have to be completely separate entities? From my understanding, a nonprofit can own a for-profit but a for-profit cannot own a nonprofit, and you too can correct me if I'm incorrect. Well, um, we we I was gonna say we need a lawyer in the call on the call, <laughs> and I was a lawyer, but I don't practice in Missouri, so uh, it, I'm in dangerous territory here. But you think of um, Veterans United. Yeah. Veterans United has a foundation. And they're giving away nice chunks of change to local and other nonprofits. So it's separate. And I don't know what the back end looks like. And I'm sure they, it involved to tax attorneys and others to set it up. But they're under one umbrella, but separate. And that's kosher. Um, and then the reverse I experienced with CMCA, right? CMCA is a nonprofit. Then they develop this. I don't know. It was social like enterprise. Mid, social, social enterprise. enterprise. It was yeah. something called Midwest Computers or something like that. I forget what the name. They branded themselves with a, their own name. They had business cards. I was a client for years and then they decided it wasn't profitable or something. And I, they kicked me to the curb. I have to find a for-profit. But it was a win-win for a while because mm -hmm. I've done work for them. Now they're doing work for me. And so there, it works that way as well. So I believe both can work. It's just the hybrid is tricky and needs to be set up um, with some accounting slash legal advice. That's Absolutely. my understanding. Yeah, I agree. But, I think at that point, you're definitely going to need an attorney involved to help sort that out. Yeah, I think the complications really comes with with your accounting, you know, piece and making sure those are separate. What we had at Encircle was that we had our nonprofit, but then within we had a micro enterprise where we built websites. And that money was um, really just fed back into the program. So we didn't need to differentiate it legally. It was just a piece of the nonprofit's uh, business, you know, um, kind of like Love Coffee sells coffee, but they're still under a nonprofit. So you can do, uh, enterprise uh, for sure and not be a for-profit it's just you're not going to be able to get investors um, in that 
for pro that enterprise, like a for-profit business could get, um, or any other type of, you know, SBA loans or different things like that, probably for, for that enterprise. And it should go back into the nonprofit arm. Yeah. Uh, but if you wanted to do a, a for-profit, then you would have to form an LLC and then just make sure that you don't have a conflict of interest uh, at all with a nonprofit so that, you know, you're making money and pouring it back into the nonprofit. So, yeah, absolutely. I think what, what we see is a lot of people who are running a business and they just want to start giving back somehow and being charitable. So again, I, and also an easier path there might be just to partner with a, with a, another charity to help with that side of things. So, or, or go um, see John Baker at the a community foundation, start a donor advised fund. Or there you go. Um, so I, I can't believe we're already 45 minutes into this call. So I, I, I definitely want to get to our next question because it's a big one. Um, and we alluded to this about the board. So one of the requirements of having a nonprofit is having a board of directors. Um, so how do you recommend a startup uh, build their board of directors? Um, Crystal, I know you have experience with this. I'd love to get your perspective. Um, so my perspective really was all around the systems of my business, honestly. So thinking about all the arms of my business and then finding board members that fit those arms, if that made sense. So I really honestly did not have a clue like how many people were supposed to be on a board or the titles of executive director or co or co-founder, any of that. I just knew that like I wanted someone who um, supported my mission. I knew I wanted someone who knew finances. I knew I wanted someone who knew marketing. I knew um, I wanted someone who um, like served my mission and understood the education aspect of what I was doing. I knew I wanted someone in Columbia Public Schools because that was the connection with the, the population that I wanted to serve. So for me, I just knew what I wanted, quote unquote, the system to look like based on who I was serving. And then I, over a year and a half, really picked women who all sat in my chair um, and then my financial planner um, at the time. And then once I, we, Malita and I were ready to go, I just asked those people and then put them where they went based on what they were doing. And I don't think there's like a number of board members you have to have. And I know if there is like a set number in Missouri, I think I had already exceeded it. Um, so for me, it was really thinking about it from the business perspective of what I needed for everything to function and then finding people who fit each of those categories. Um, and like I said, I did that over a year and a half of the people that sat in my chair. So that was kind of how I did it. I think that um, I, I looked it up and I, I think you do have to have a minimum of three people. Yeah. Um, so, but I love that. That's one thing that, again, I need to be better at. And I'm on some other boards that are working on this about a, a matrix, a board matrix of different specialties. You don't want just people who are passionate about your mission. They need to have a diverse selection of um, expertises, their own circles of people. And I, I'm probably taking some of your answers. So Terry, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's good. You want to see how well connected they are in the community and the expertise that they can bring to your board. Um, sometimes though, what I found, which was difficult was that you could get the expertise um, and you could get their connection, but you may not get a passion. Um, and so, so that was always tricky because, um, you know, did, did we always find somebody who had a personal connection to autism? Um, no, we didn't. Uh, so we, were, we would look for those people who, who had those two questions qualities, but also that we knew would step up to the plate. Did we, did we uh, do that? Well, 100% of the time, definitely not. Um, but, and you would be surprised at the people who would really step up to the plate and, and make some things happen for you um, compared to some of the people who you thought might. Um, but, you know, I definitely wanted a strong financial person that was very, very important, regardless if they had any connection uh, to the cause. But if they had just this uh, mission to make organizations financially sound and that was their passion, then perfect. Um, so, you know, it is tricky. You, you do, need, do need people who are the dishwashers and the floor sweepers and, and all that. Um, and then you need other people who will put their time in and putting the time is something that we all want them to do. And especially as a startup, um, some of them were surprised at how much 
we were asking them to do. So being very clear at the very beginning, as clear as possible, that here's the role that, that we'll be asking and putting pressure on you to do. Do you, you know, <laughs> do you want this? <laughs> you feel like begging sometimes, but, um, but yeah, then you, you come up with some people who want to be there and you also need to provide them insurance. Some people don't realize that when they are starting a nonprofit, make sure you have insurance that covers the board. Otherwise, it's not a very gracious ask uh, because, but, but you may not even be aware that, um, that your board needs uh, coverage um, because they could be at risk for uh, some lawsuits. So you definitely, that must happen um, at the very beginning. Wow, I had no idea about that. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. One thing we implemented um, in terms of the board was we actually wrote them a, a job description that we, when they agree to come on the board, we have them sign an actual job description of their role so that there's no questions later about what they committed their time to. Um, so that's been really awesome. And then you can see right away if they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to do any of this, um, then hopefully you've got yourself a good board member. Carolyn, you work directly with boards all the time with the, the people that you serve. Um, so what do you have to add to this? Yeah, you see these gray hairs? These, these, are, these are from executives. They're from, they're from boards, uh, most of them. Uh, maybe I should go see uh, Crystal. She can cover up my gray hair. Uh, all right. Um, so I totally agree with my colleagues here that uh, I like I like to start with passion when I'm recruiting staff. I like to encourage executives and boards to to look for passion. Um, I agree with Terry that you know sometimes you can't get it and it's really important to get the finance person on. But to the extent you can load your board with people who are passionate about your mission, um, make that a priority. And then the matrix was mentioned. It's not, to, from my point of view, it's not just about, um, you know, who's the lawyer and who's got the financial background and who knows about, you know, who's worked with um, young girls before and who knows anything about uh, autism. It's also about um, character and personality. Um, it's, it's like you're having a dinner party and you're pulling people together, right? And what is the culture of your organization? and for instance, I'm the kind of board member who asks, I, I know you're going to be shocked, who asks a lot of questions. <laughs> and in some boards, that's not well received. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've had my hands smacked because I've asked a direct question of, a, of an executive, which I thought was my role, but wasn't re well received by the board president. And so guess what? That wasn't a good fit. And I stepped off that board. So knowing like the character of the people and the personalities of the people, is, uh, is that going to fit uh, well with what you're trying to build? Um, and then, you know, I'm a big fan of BoardSource has this nine step board building cycle. And when you're starting up, it's about identifying your needs around board members, right? <laughs> Right. What is our mission? Where do we think we're going? And who do we need on the bus to, to help us go there? Right. It sounds like Crystal's very systematic about this. Um, but then, you know, this board building cycle, which you can find at boardsource.org, has these other seven steps. And I've got them in front of me, like, you know, it's identify board members, cultivate potential leaders, recruit the prospects, orient Cheryl. Untershoots in the in the chat said something about onboarding. I've seen too many organizations with bad onboarding processes. And then it goes on from there. And the last step is celebrate. How many of us have been part, part of either board or organizations where you're not celebrating the successes in order to cohere the, the team? So the, the board. Um, so those are some of my thoughts about, about uh, Absolutely. And yeah, in the chat as well, we had also remembering diversity and inclusion and making sure you have representation from different socioeconomic groups. And I mean, there's, there is a lot to think about for sure. So um, you guys are right on it. Anything else about boards that you guys want? I mean, and this wasn't a pre-planned thing, but what do you do whenever you have a board member that's not performing, I guess, is also a tough one. Um, it's, not so, it's not so tough. It's just that we have Missouri Nice. 
Go ahead, Crystal. Yeah, but yeah. I think um, I can say when I started, um, even with having the matrix and everyone who was on my board, I knew them. Like I said, they sat in my chair. So going back to that personality wise, like I liked everybody. Um, but when we first formed our board, um, just because I loved them didn't mean that everybody was going to mesh um, amazingly. And um, yeah, so just, I know I had an incident and for me, it was like, I am so direct. I am very professional. So like there were, again, that job requirements that were there before they ever joined the board. And so for me, it was just a simple conversation that say, you know, I love you. I love your passion about the project, but just the way that I want to see this grow, the personalities just aren't working. And, mm -hmm. and with that being said that I'm, I'm going to have to replace you. So I'm just, <laughs> you know, I just am very direct. So I think for me, it's being, if, especially if the expectations are there, what we expect from someone and what our mission is, then it's really easy to back up. This is what I expected. This is what happened. This is why we're going to have to let you go. So for me, it's pretty cut and dry. Love it. And, and for those of you who are not as uh, assertive as uh, Ms. Crystal, I would say that that is really the responsibility of the board president to, to, to manage the board. And so Crystal might whisper in the ear and then that person has the conversation with the underperforming board and says, what if you, what if you go now? You're like, yeah. you know, or take a leave of absence. Um, I've seen board members take years a leave of absence and then cycle back yeah um but uh that that's something can i say one more thing about boards okay. clarifying expectations before you even get them on the board is mm -hmm. so important and and crystal's talking about job job descriptions that helps but just making it clear because you don't want to sucker them in only to have them realize oh my god i gotta do fundraising mm -hmm. oh man and then they'll be out the back door um so being, being honest with them about the meetings and, and what you expect of them. And I even, I mean, I'm very upfront and some boards that I serve on too, they were upfront if there is going to be a requirement or an expected requirement of a personal uh, co contribution financially to, um, so even with our board, uh, we, you know, in their job description, it says that they're, they commit to either personally or finding another income source of a certain amount to contribute to. And that would be hard as a, as a startup, um, as a startup nonprofit for sure, but it's just something to consider uh, with, with your board recruitment as well. So um, I cannot believe that that was the quickest hour of my life. I'm pretty sure you guys are such a wealth of information. Before we sign off, is there anything else, any tips you would say to someone who's about to take the leap of launching a nonprofit? Go ahead, Terry. I feel, I feel like sometimes I'm really um, reluctant when I hear somebody say, I'm going to start a nonprofit, just because I know how difficult and complex it is now. <laughs> so it's probably good that I was naive when I first started. But I also know that because of, you know, starting it and seeing it through that I know, you know, my son's life has been changed as well as others who have gone through this nonprofit. And, um, and so, you know, you just have to learn all along the way and it's okay if, you know, this is all, everything we said is going to be super overwhelming, but you just encounter those little hills and then that's another hill you get over and you learn and you grow and your mission continues. And it's very cool when you get to hear the stories of your mission and how that's impacted the lives of the families or the, the individual that you're serving. And then you're like, okay, it's, it's worth it. You're not going to get accolades. You're not going to get money, <laughs> you know, but you're going to get, get those stories that say, okay, you know, that hill, that mountain, that was worth it. And then you have to realize when it's time to pass that on to somebody else, because your energy has, uh, has been used up. And mm -hmm. if you can pass it on and the leadership still continues uh, that's okay too. You you grow with it, and you you can impact lives um, as you learn and grow, and suffer and celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry, Carolyn, Crystal. Anything to add there? 
No, I, I think very Go ahead, Chris. beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, Last I time. loved the celebrate message that Jeff, uh, Terry just threw out because so many um, of, of you all don't celebrate enough um, when you've achieved something we just rush from the next rush to the next fire and the next fire and the next fire mm -hmm. and um and that's why it, it makes it even more difficult work than it already is um but when i was contemplating my business a, a very um a, a friend of mine who had run a very successful business said to me you will never have all the i's dotted and the t's crossed because I was the kind of person who needed, I thought I needed at that point in time, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed to step off the curb and start doing it. And she was like, you'll never have that. So, so don't get, if you feel like you've got a, you, you've identified a need, the data says there's a need and you're passionate about it and you're, and you, you're up to the task, which is considerable, then, then think of Nike and just do it. I love it. Absolutely. And we coach our for-profit businesses on that too, about not getting so in the weeds, just, just go, just, you can go. There's never going to be a perfect time. So um, I can't thank you guys enough. This has been really infor like so informative, even for myself. I know our coaches are going to love this. People who came on late, uh, we will be posting this recording on our Missouri Women's Business Center Facebook page and YouTube. Uh, so we can check it out there. Thank you again, Terry, Carolyn, and Crystal. I think you've helped a lot of people today. Um, and I really appreciate all of you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you all so much. Stay well.